uh, this radiation not only hurts the young sailors, but it hurts their offsprings. Uh, this is a declaration from the wife of a sailor who writes in her declaration to the court, my husband was exposed to radiation particles while assigned to the 7th Fleet on the USS Ronald Reagan assisting in Operation Tomodachi beginning in March of 2011. As a result of this exposure, our son, who was born on November 14, 2012, at eight months was diagnosed with brain and spine cancer. These are just a few examples of what these young sailors are dealing with. And one last report. This is a sailor who's 22, has been diagnosed with leukemia, and is losing his eyesight. And he writes in his declaration to the court, Upon my return from Operation Tomodachi, I began losing my eyesight. I lost all vision in my left eye and most vision in my right eye. I am unable to read street signs, and I'm no longer able to drive. Prior to Operation Tomodachi, I had 20-20 eyesight, wore no glasses, and had no corrective eye surgery. Additionally, I know of no family member who have had leukemia. So these are examples of the kinds of illnesses and injuries that these young sailors are experiencing. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion. Charles Bonner, attorney, joining us from San Francisco. Lieutenant Steve Simmons, a U.S. Navy sailor. And when we come back, we'll also be joined by Kyle Cleveland. He's a professor. He'll join us from Yokohama, Japan, to talk about documents he obtained of backstage uh, conversations among U.S. officials about the radiation risk at the time that all of this was happening three years we're talking about a class action suit that has been brought by Marines and U.S. sailors against TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company that runs the nuclear power plants that melted down March, uh, in that week of March 11, 2011, uh, after the earthquake led to the tsunami that created this catastrophe. Our guests are Lieutenant Steve Simmons, uh, who is a sailor who participated on the USS Reagan in relief efforts, now suffering from very serious health ailments potentially related to radiation exposure, uh, one of the plaintiffs in the suit. We're also joined by his attorney, the class action attorney, Charles Bonner. He's in San Francisco. And we now go to Professor Kyle Cleveland, who recently wrote Mobilizing Nuclear Bias, the Fukushima Nuclear Crisis and the Politics of Uncertainty. Um, Kyle Cleveland, thanks for joining us from Japan. Uh, talk about the backstage conversations that were taking place in among the U.S. military and U.S. officials, and how did you get a hold of these conversations? The documents you're referring to are through the Freedom of Information Act, and these were documents that were made available maybe six or eight months after the crisis started through the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And in these documents, these were transcribed telephone conversations between NRC officials in Washington, D.C., embassy and diplomatic staff in Tokyo, and also people in Pacific Command or United States Forces Japan, principally the Navy. And what those documents reveal is that there was a lot of backstage discussion by these experts who were trying to assess just how bad the situation was. I think you quoted in the document a discussion in which they were saying, this is on, I think, March 13th, that they were picking up rates at about 100 nautical miles out from the plant that were 30 times above background and would represent um, a thyroid dose, a committed dose equivalent to the thyroid um, that in a 10-hour period would exceed the protective action guidelines set up by the Department of Energy. So in my research, I, I've interviewed some 160 people, including um, diplomats and diplomatic staff and people within the various nuclear agencies. Um, it's been quite interesting to see that at that period of time, particularly in about the first 10 days or so after the crisis began, there was a great deal of disagreement and a great deal of debate backstage about just how bad this was and what those rates represented and uh, whether or not they could verify this. Uh, keep in mind that TEPCO, at this period of time, in the period of time that we're talking about where the Reagan sailors would have been exposed, they were trying to, frantically, trying to deal with the situation. They were in a station blackout, and even though that they knew that the radiation levels were quite high, that wasn't really making it into the public. Um, when we talk about TEPCO, I think it's important to make a distinction between the operational staff at the plant who were really working desperately 24 hours a day to deal with this, 
and the TEPCO officials, including their spokesman, who were really downplaying the situation, and anyone who followed the situation at that time. It was quite confusing. It was very frustrating that uh, in every stage of this, they were downplaying just how bad it was. And so in the first few days, the United States really had no information that they could act upon. And so very quickly, they set up their own radiation assessment. You know, the United States has a great deal of military assets in, in Japan, some 82 military bases, and their own radiation measurements starting about on the 13th or 14th of March and going for months after that, revealing that the situation was really quite a bit more severe than what TEPCO was acknowledging. So according to the documents that you saw about these conversations, the Navy was aware that the sailors on the USS Reagan would be exposed to dangerous levels of radiation? Well, what they were, the readings that they were getting, um, these were coming from helicopters that were flying relief missions for the tsunami effort. Um, they had landed on a Japanese command ship that was about 50 miles away from the plan. And the measurements that they were getting clearly alarmed them. These were readings much higher than they expected. Uh, in the documentation, again, the Freedom of Information Act documents, they did not anticipate that they would have really any readings of significance at 100 nautical miles. And yet they were getting readings that were that would exceed a protective action guideline dose in, in a 10-hour period. So they were aware um, that they were getting hit by this radiation. Keep in mind, in the first week or so of the crisis, at least the first four or five days, the wind was blowing out to sea. And aside from these inland communities very close to the reactor, the first people that were hit by this plume were the U.S. military. And these nuclear aircraft carriers are arguably some of the most sophisticated ra radiation measuring devices in the world. And what those documents reveal is that their alarms set off at, at very consistent levels, and they saw that they were getting um, rates that were surprising them. So, Professor the Cleveland, yeah. why isn't the U.S. Navy responsible for this as well as TEPCO, as Japan, the nuclear power company? Well, I think that the real question is whether or not the U.S. government, and the U.S. Navy in particular, took the appropriate protective action measures given the information that they had available at the time. You know, it's very easy now to look in retrospect and, and make these kind of uh, severe judgments about this now that we have more information and there's a lot more transparency to this. But at the time, they had very little information to act on. And from what I've gathered, at least from my interviews, they immediately were trying to take protective measures. They moved the, the carrier off. They did stop the water supply after they saw that it had become contaminated. Um, for many of the servicemen who were close in, they provided potassium iodine to protect them against thyroid doses. And they set up also a radiation registry called the Tomodachi Registry, which is still publicly available as an online interactive website that allows servicemen and anyone who was in Japan at that time in proximity to the plant to go on and see where they were at a given day and what their do estimated dose exposures were. So I think the United States government and the Navy was doing whatever they could. Keep in mind that many of the officers and the administrative staff that we're dealing with, they were on the ship themselves, or they were at the military bases in Japan where their families were living, and they were also being exposed to this. So I think that, you know, for many people who are not privy to these backstage discussions and these kind of elite-level decision makers and the kind of rationale and reasons for why they were making their decisions, it may seem that somehow it was unreasonable or unfair. But when you scrutinize it closely, I think that they were trying to take the appropriate protective um, actions. The question of whether or not that was was useful and whether or not they were, in fact, the, the best measures they could take is, is kind of another question. I wanted to go back to Naoto Kan, an interview we did on the third anniversary of the meltdowns, uh, March 11th. Naoto Kan was the prime minister of Japan when the Fukushima Daiichi meltdown occurred. I spoke to him in Tokyo when we broadcast from Japan uh, weeks ago. Uh, the former prime minister spoke about the inaccuracy of the information TEPCO provided to him at the time of the disaster. From what I was hearing from the headquarters of TEPCO, and in particular from Mr. Takeguro, who was the former vice president, uh, was had almost no accurate information being conveyed about what was actually the situation on site.
The former prime minister um, of uh, Naoto, uh, the former prime minister of Japan, uh, he went on to say that he flew to the uh, the nuclear plant because he couldn't get accurate information from TEPCO officials to speak to workers where he could get accurate information. I wanted to go back to Lieutenant Steve Simmons. What was your health like before March 11th, 2011, three years ago? Uh, before March, I was actually in what I would like to consider relatively good health. Um, I was physically active. I had been doing uh, P90X and Insanity workouts, and oftentimes kind of a hybrid between the two of them. And the summer of 2010, uh, when I was down in Hawaii, uh, one day I had met up with a friend and gone out and did a trail run the following day, hiked uh, Diamond Head, and then after the day or so after that, I went and hiked Stairway to Heaven. So I was in pretty good health. Lieutenant Simmons, can you explain when you decided to join uh, this lawsuit and what you'd like to see happen now? It wasn't, well, for a long time actually after my ailment started, I had tried to find out if there was anybody else that was dealing with similar in, uh, issues or other ailments related to, uh, from that deployment. And I had reached out to some of the other folks that I was uh, stationed with on board the Reagan, and they hadn't heard anything. And it wasn't until, I think, December of 12, when my wife's sister had actually sent her a news article talking about the original plaintiffs of the case. Uh, shortly after that, I had reached out to Paul and his team and um, inquired with them about it and sent them my information. And it really, for me, it comes down to the, f the fact that, uh, like Charles said, a, a lot of these sailors and Marines are in their early 20s, mid-20s, and they haven't had the luxury that I've had to do 16 years of the service. and be awarded the opportunity for medical retirement, and these young sailors and Marines need to be taken care of. And that was the main driving force for me to come forward and bring my information to Paul and Charles to, to help strengthen their case to make sure that these individuals are taken care of in the manner that they deserve. How many people are on the USS Reagan? Uh, approximately 5,500. Mm. I want to thank you all for joining us. Lieutenant Steve Simmons, U.S. sailor, uh, part of the class action suit that's being represented by Paul Garner and Charles Bonner. Charles Bonner, our guest from San Francisco. And Professor Kyle Cleveland, thank you for joining us from Yokohama, Japan. Uh, we'll link to your piece, Mobilizing Nuclear Bias.